All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. You've reached the internet's home for all things masonry. Join On The Level Podcast as we plumb the depths of our ancient craft and try to unlock the mysteries, dispel the fallacies, and utilize the teachings of Freemasonry to unlock the greatness within each of us. I have you now. Welcome back to On The Level Podcast. Today we have uh, a frozen Matt Stone. He is uh, an icicle of a man there. He'll probably come back. He's having some thunderstorms in the Turkey Creek area. Oh, he's bounced out. And uh, the, our main guest today is brother, my brother, Juan Sepulveda. I probably said that horribly wrong. Welcome to the podcast, brother Sepulveda. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brother Chris. <laughs> oh, hold your applause. Hold your applause. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it, I, I put the strength in the pull. So it's Sepulveda. Sepulveda. Oh, that makes more sense. Juan Sepulveda. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's It's been an, uh, a pleasure to spend some time with you uh, ah. in different events. Yeah. And now finally get a chance to sit down and have a conversation over the podcast. I'm I'm honored to be invited. Honestly, really, thank you for coming because I've been a fan of yours ever since I first, uh, you didn't meet me, but I saw you. Um, and Matt's back. He's on yeah. Frozen. <laughs> Welcome back, Matt. By the way, the whole, I, I hopped in and you're like, well, you didn't meet me. I saw you. Like, what a way to I'm make a it creeper. Weird, Chris. I'm a creeper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't I even invited. I was creeping from a window. Like I knew I like... saw something weird back here. Yeah. <laughs> By Chris? the way, that new bedspread looks fantastic. <laughs> you smell different when you're awake. <laughs> this is going in a direction I like. <laughs> no, but seriously, I, I actually the first time I I met you in person was at the Hillsborough Lodge and That's they were true. doing a Masonic education symposium that we both spoke at. That's right. Um, I was nervous as hell, but you were smooth as butter, man. You, you did a great presentation that really like touched. Uh, I, I'm going to rephrase that for Matt's purposes that really like spoke to me. Uh, I know that I was about to set him up for a good one and I did not want him to knock that one down. Uh, that first off, how rude. How dare you take the softball from me, sir? I really should have. Okay. It really touched me. (laughs) He's not going to touch that one now. Uh, No, but I I was watching you give a speech. I have an issue with public speaking that I've struggled with. One of the things that masonry has probably helped me with the most in my life is that issue, which I totally could never have expected, man. Like when I came to a lodge, I didn't know anybody in Freemasonry or anything about Freemasonry. I met a friend that was a Mason. And so because of him, I looked into it and he's not even from our state. So I went into a lodge, not knowing anyone or knowing anything about Freemasonry. So the only question I asked, the only thing that mattered to me was, Hey, there's no public speaking in this, right? Oh, boy. And they were like, no, no, of course not. None at all. And it, I think I became an EA and it was the same night. They're like, okay, time to get ready for your give back. And I'm like, what is a give back? And they're like, oh, you're going to stand in front of everybody and we're going to humiliate you and you're going to have to do it from memory. I'm like, what? Uh, I'm not, I did not sign up for this. And I realized like, this is why I'm here. Um, I have to deal with this crap. So I've been on a journey of getting better at it. And so when I saw you speak, you, uh, and we were talking about this a little bit before the episode started, I got like really, uh, you know, it seemed effortless. You didn't seem to have a big ego. A lot of guys that are really good at public speaking have a, it comes across like they're really egotistical and you didn't come across that way. Um, that means and it was the same with Daniel that. Molina. You guys both gave like some awesome presentations. Thank you. And uh, I love that dude. I, I, I do. I, I have been in love with public speaking for, for most of my life. Um, I was the kid that whenever I had a grade that was kind of like flailing, 
I would approach the teacher and say, any chance I can get some extra credit, maybe a presentation? You want to do a presentation? Yeah, uh, on anything. Are you sure on anything? Yeah, potassium it is. I got. I did a presentation on potassium, and I got to say. <laughs> potassium? On potassium. It was a chemistry class. So, uh, yeah. So I've done. So you just came out the womb like, look at me, look at me. <laughs> so I really enjoyed, you know. Going out, learning, having the pressure, knowing that I have to be ready to present and then standing up there and distilling what I learned. That, I've always enjoyed that. And I have to say, you did very well on that presentation. So you hit it. If if you had any problems with it, I think you hit it very well. So That's very nice of you to say. Yeah, no, I did. And uh, so the guy I did it with used to be my co-host on the show, Fred Packwood. And he could attest to you if he was here. Like, I can start off strong. And I bring a lot of energy, but the longer it goes on, the more my anxiety sets in. Oh, I see. And you'll see my hands go in my pockets and you'll see me start to step backwards more and like try to disappear the longer it goes on. And he's pointed that out to me. And I'm like, yeah, like if you're there and you're paying attention, you'll see how terrified I am. That's interesting. Like nerves and anxiety, all of that manifests differently for people. Um, one interesting thing that used to happen to me a lot, it hasn't happened recently, but it's happened within a few years, is that I know I have to give a presentation. I'm not 100% sure when in the meeting or when in the event it's going to happen. So I am, I'm waiting for the cue. And it happens, and I'm not nervous. I stand up, I deliver, I do everything. I try to close, make sure that I do the best that I could. And then I sit down and I get this rush of nervousness after, after I'm done with the presentation. Which is you're the you're complete thing. opposite. It's you're a bizarro presenter. That's a weird. <laughs> you're supposed to like I get all my confidence right after. I feel like oh my god, I could do this every day. Oh, I yeah. I'm the king of the world. And then the next day, someone's like, you should do that again. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this one thing. Uh, you know, hearing your example. When you join Masonry, you have this issue with public speaking. Mm -hmm. You were surprised by being able to return the catechism. Uh, you're not alone in that. There's a lot of brothers that join Masonry, and they are not particularly fond of standing in front of a crowd and being examined, basically. Uh, one thing to take out of this uh, brief exchange is the fact that <clears throat> there are people at different levels in standing in front of a crowd presenting and you know, the benefits that come with being able to stand in front of other people and share oh, an idea yeah. effectively. Cause it, yeah. it helps you at, at lodge. It can help you at work. It can help you in your church anywhere in your own home like, at home. Exactly. Yeah. So just lean on a brother. If you see a brother that you like how he delivers the lecture, you know, a brother and you like how he stands up and, um, gives the charge at the opening of the meeting. Ask them for some tips. Offer yourself as a sacrifice and do it yourself sure. on the next <laughs> yeah. on the next degree. I mean, it's the only way. I've learned that as a man. The only way uh, cuz I don't have a fear, I have a phobia. It's mm. beyond the fear. It's an irrational fear. Fooled I me. have no control over it. My body reacts in a way that I don't want it to. Um, wow. you know, things start to shut down. My mind, you know, I've got the first time I ever sat in the East. My vision got so tunneled down uh -huh. to like, it looked like I had like a one little hole I was looking out of. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure I was about to pass out. That's amazing. And so my first word from the East was <clears throat> this. Woo! <laughs> and everyone was like, oh my God, is he okay? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I had to get that. Out. I think I feel better now. And That's then we funny. proceeded. Like, it, it's not a normal response to fear. But actually, because of this phobia, I've researched it. And it's the number one fear that people have yeah. is public, above death. Yeah, people fear public speaking. Yeah. So it's, it's to crazy. have a mastery of it innately gives you a huge advantage over other humans, you know? Yeah, it, it is. You should have gone into politics. You could be running countries right now. <laughs> well, maybe. Maybe someday I'll run a, 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 a community club <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I just heard the door open to Juan running for Grandmaster one day. I don't well, know I if anyone else heard it. I heard the exact same thing. If you're listening, 
We will we'll set up a GoFundMe. He's going to run for the Grand Line. Excellent. Oh my goodness. You heard it here first on the Level Podcast. Don't, don't give me some. Don't give me enemies so early in the show. <laughs> <laughs> the target just got huge. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I do appreciate the. the, the no, so uh, your your presentation was actually it wasn't just your speaking, but the content of your presentation that day kind of spoke to me. It was about communion with the divine, and it was about astronomy. It was about the, the the web telescope and what it's doing for us as a species and how science is taking the unknowable and making it knowable. And that is bringing us closer to God. Yeah. Uh, imagine that science is, and I, I am, I don't know how you guys, I I'm really curious how Matt feels about this because he's the most devout religious of the three of us. But to me, I don't understand the religious people who, who kind of don't like science because it's bringing us closer to God. In my view, like, you know, the more we understand the world, the more we see how complex and how like the rules don't really apply at the quantum level. Um, So the, the tinier and the closer we look at things, the more I think it answers our questions and feeds into the idea that there is a creator, there is an intelligence behind this. So I'm curious how you feel about that, Matt, especially. Like, do you feel like science is getting you closer to your relationship or is it something to be feared from a church going man yourself? No, I don't I don't think science should be feared at all. Uh, and I started to form this opinion. I was in, I think, either middle school or early high school, whenever the whole stem cell argument was coming across in yeah. the late 90s, early 2000s. That whole stem cell thing, it they were like, oh, they're killing babies and they're, you know, they're using that to harvest stem cells. And it's like, my daughter is going to be three in August. And we actually were able to, to take part of the umbilical cord and save and freeze those stem cells. So that way, if my daughter ever has a serious disease in the future, um, they can utilize those stem cells for like a bone marrow transplant or something along those lines. My dad passed away from complications with cancer. So this is all something that I studied very heavily. So I look at it and it's like, all right, the people that were saying, oh, no, they're killing babies don't really understand. You can get it from the umbilical cord. Right. You can get the stem cells from that. Right. I think it's a it's a matter of ignorance. And so you kind of yeah. have this like, uh, I, I don't know what how to call it, but like a knee jerk reaction of like they're killing babies. Like and that's always the go to for the church. Just, they're well, killing and, babies. And that's such an emotional, visceral connection people have to protecting children. Yes. When you say you're hurting babies, we're immediately going to hate that idea, whatever it is. Yeah. And so I I kind of started to change my mind on the whole science conversation because I know the, you know, the Catholic Church has their whole history of like off with his head. Um, so <laughs> I know they have that whole ordeal. Um, oh, what do you, you mean, mean like... the sun doesn't revolve around the earth? <laughs> Prison for 10 years for you, sir. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, I, I kind of started to change my mind on it. And especially when, it, you know, whenever they found the God particle. And so they, you know, whenever they looked at... Um, um, you know, the, the fact of whenever a, a embryo is fertilized, there's actually a flash of light that happens, you know, those sorts of things. I think that's the coolest stuff ever. And so it actually gives more, um, it explains a little bit more, some of the phrases out of the Bible that are said by God or by Jesus, because they're saying that they're saying that from a completely different mindset than what we would ever consider. And here we are 2000 later, 2000 years later. And it's like, whenever we talk about that, we are the light of the world. And it's like, oh, there's actually a flash of light that happens whenever a a or sorry, whenever a um, an egg is implanted. You know, it's just it. I think it's cool. I like science. Um, I, I just wish CERN would stop all their stuff that they're doing, but that's for another another. You don't time. Want, you don't want a black hole to 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 originate underneath the crust of the earth? No, no. I, I'm a huge fan of not starting black holes <laughs> underneath the crust of the earth. Actually, they're tiny and temporary, so. No need yeah, to worry. It's totally about it. fine. Totally controlled. <laughs> I'm not taking back what I said. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, science I, is is amazing and frightening and terrifying. It's like everything all rolled into one for me. Like I'm mm-hmm. I'm terrified by the fact that we, you know, these people doing science are just meat flesh people like me. Like I, I know they're smarter than me, uh, but they're not. They're not like. Uh, magnitudes of intelligence smarter than me and uh, this is dangerous stuff when you get into the quantum and you're talking about like uh you know generating m- microscopic black holes and uh 
trying to recreate a wormhole and uh, anti, you know, gravity, which is going to involve insane amounts of magnetic fields, which can rip our planet. In. Like this stuff is no joke. The atomic yeah. weapon itself, you know, is physics. And I was just reading an interview where uh, uh, someone that's in the military literally said, look, if this alien thing turns out, you know, it, to be interdimensional or something, we're literally going to classify mathematics, parts of mathematics, which is what we did in the 60s. They classified certain aspects of mathematics, like certain physics were classified by the U.S. government and you couldn't learn it. Or Interesting. Teach it or talk about it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you, you, mentioned, you, you mentioned that there's obviously there's an element of how much do we know of what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. And if you, if you go back to the root of where fear comes from, most of the fear that we experience comes from the not knowing. I don't know what's behind this door or I don't know what's making that sound. I don't yeah. know uh, what this person is capable of doing. So a lot of the fear that comes or manifests itself against these kinds of uh, search for light if if we can keep it in the in the theme of the conversation that search for light is trying to answer some of these questions that we may have so that we're no longer afraid or we have a better idea of what we need to be afraid and not um i do when with the presentation of the of the james webb telescope uh when i when i start talking about it I mentioned how I came up with the idea. And it was that I was waiting for many, many years for the uh, Arians 5 rocket to take the James Webb telescope up to space. So when it actually took off, uh, it was December the 25th of 2021. It was after the day after Christmas it went up? It was Christmas, Christmas Day? Christmas Day. Um, so here I'm in the middle of my living room looking at a tiny little screen of this thing taking off uh in into space because i knew what what was happening there nobody cared none of my friends knew honestly what was i had happening. no idea yeah, yeah but i was in pins and needles i knew that the cargo that was on the inside the fairings of that that rocket was... we had hubble in my mind we got hubble that's the best yeah the, what else do we need that's the best of my lifetime. It's already there. Like, we're good, right? Yep. But no, this is the capacity of this thing to look with more precision to the things that we got a hint about with Hubble is incredible. Like, just the, it is incredible. The size difference, the, uh, the ability to remain perfectly still, which is, is one of the themes of the presentation, is remaining perfectly still, perfectly quiet. Which meant this telescope is going to be put in a place of, of space, which is uh, the specific location is called the Lagrange point. This is Lagrange point number two. And it's just a pocket of gravity. If you can think that the gravity of the sun is pulling one way, the earth is pulling another, the moon is pulling here, the planets or anything else that's around, it's pulling. But there's these pockets where the pull of everything becomes like an equilibrium. And you can mm. put something there and it's not falling towards anything. It's just perfectly quiet, perfectly still. And in addition to that, the James Webb Telescope one difference, main difference that it had from from the Hubble was that it had this complex array of shields to cover the sun from its instruments for for two reasons. To prevent the light of the sun to contaminate the light that it's going to be receiving from other celestial bodies, but also the heat. So the instruments in this telescope had to get to such a low temperature that it needed this complex array of uh, of shields to protect it. And in the presentation, I make a joke about, okay, dork, what does any of this have to do with Freemasonry? Here you're holding me for 10 minutes talking about this stupid telescope. <laughs> What's the deal? It really did. I was thinking that as you were giving the presentation. I was it, like, where's he going with this? Get to the point, sir! <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is that 
when I started thinking about what this telescope is doing in order to see further in, 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 in the universe, I saw so many parallels with our efforts to correspond with the divine. For us to communicate with what we call deity or God or whatever we want to call it. The unknown. The unknown. The unknowable. That which some may be in fear of because they don't understand. And we need to search for light in order to understand it better and know what to fear and what to not fear. So it requires that we are able to shield ourselves from the terrestrial. So just like the shields in the, in the James Webb telescope are shielding the instruments of this telescope, we need to find ways for us to shield ourselves from the, the terrestrial uh, distractions. The, the noise, the chatter, oh the God, right? this side and that side. And what about this and that? And, oh, you got to recycle, but this and that. You're like, ah, ah. Exactly. Not, not only that, but to, to your earlier point and Chris, to your point where you're like, oh, we have Hubble. We're fine. <clears throat> also to shield us from what we know is the current truth. And mm. by the current truth, you know, if you look out the James Webb telescope, if memory serves me right, correct me if I'm wrong, but the James Webb telescope has... Uh, essentially shown where there are super earths out there s capable of sustaining life. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you talk to Christians and you're like, Hey, are there, is there life on other planets? No, because it's not in the Bible. My response to them every single time is why are you putting God in such a small box? Mm. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Is your God not strong enough or yeah. capable or not capable of is be careful he not your sovereign? answer? <laughs> Can you yeah, be careful with that answer? Right. Because you may you may like crumble your whole philosophy system if you say that your god isn't strong enough to have put life on yeah. other planets is that it's like that um like that question said can god create a, a rock so heavy even he couldn't lift it and then some people go into shock and like get offline <laughs> It's like a robot malfunction. Like, yeah. eh, does not compute, cannot. No. <laughs> I, I call that the AOL dial-up tone face. I know. <laughs> but there's so much we don't know. And the only way that we can learn about it is through a search. It's through looking up, you know, looking out, trying to figure out how do we get from a place of ignorance or a place of darkness and into a place of knowledge and light. So that parallel of the telescope trying to put itself in the perfect conditions to be able to even understand what God means. I mean, God means something completely different to the three of us. You have a yes. different relationship with deity than I do. And then Matt does like it is something different to each of us. But the only way that we can get closer to the truth wherever that truth lives is through that search. And in our case, the effective search for light requires that we prepare our instrument. So that analogy of perfectly still and perfectly quiet, it's materialized in us, allowing yourself to shut down that cacophony in your mind to relax to a point of meditation or prayer so that now you are able to filter the noise from the signal. I don't know if you have, have any of you tried to do like uh, astrophotography before? I have with my iPhone and it doesn't work out so well. <laughs> okay. Well, I, it's cause it's an iPhone. <laughs> I tried to make magic <laughs> with a telescope that I had and in a camera and uh, I started researching and trying to in, uh, inform myself uh, how is, is it done. And there was one thing that I knew if we are rotating, right? So we have Earth is rotating. And what we're looking at is so far away from us that the light coming from it is so faint. You need to train your telescope to stay looking at it for a long period of time in order for right. all that light to be captured by your camera. Well... A lot of the astrophotography that is able to look so clear and so crisp is because the, um, what do you call that? The, the lens, the, well, what collects the information 
the, the whole mechanism. So you have the lens and then you have the receptor back here, whatever this thing is called. It has to mm -hmm. be trained on the object with no movement at all for the well, longest. That's why they use arrays, right? They have like uh, different areas of the earth where they have these things. So as the earth spins, they can keep it trained on that it, object. Exactly. That's one of the, that's one of the, the ways that it's able to do like with Hubble, for example, because it's out in space, you can keep it well, pointing at whatever for the length of time that you can. But with the camera down here, you spend five minutes, you know, with your lens and aperture and whatever you were looking at has already streaked, you know, enough degrees that it's going to make your image blurry. So part of the process in astrophotography, one of the techniques that you can do is that you take multiple exposures, okay, multiple exposures in the same area. And then you line all of the images together and you are able to run a filter. So you blend all of those images together. Some of it is going to be noise and some of it is going to be real signal or light coming from these objects. So when you run this algorithm, it cleans out all the noise and then you're able to get the message. Basically, it's like, oh, yeah, look how I can I can see the rings around this planet. Yeah. You know, now think about how could that apply to us? You know, you can. Can I can you? tell you exactly how. Tell me. I, I want to hear. I want to hear. I have moved to a very hidden away place in South Carolina. I have surrounded by forest. Nice. I have no people near me. I don't go out anymore. I don't go to lodges. I I don't go to work. I don't. It's quiet. When I go outside at night, it's it's not quiet because there's life everywhere, everywhere, and surrounded by life. But it's a different kind of life than I was surrounded by when I was living in a city. That's human life. Oh, human life is 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 a whole nother kind of busy sound. Now that I'm out here in the quiet, um, I spent a, a certain amount of time adjusting my life, right? Like physically, monetarily, things I had to do. Once that was over, the biggest challenge I dealt with was my mind. Mm. It was so quiet that I had to deal with all the voices in my head that I subconsciously was filling up my life with noise so I wouldn't hear it. Wow. And the biggest challenge I had moving out here was dealing with myself. Wow. That's the truth. Wow. To, to deal with those voices that you don't want to listen to mm -hmm. from your past, from the things that you've done, like all the bad things in life that we run from, we don't want to face. When you're alone in the quiet, that's what, that's what you have to deal with because that's all you've got. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. And think about... You know, another another way to look at the whole noise to signal ratio, you have, let's say the three of us have this conversation and we're done. You know, we hang up, we go sit down, drink something. You're like, you know what? Like, like what Matt said about um, about the stem cells and the the embryos, like, you know, I think he was onto something with that. And then I'll start churning on that little bit of information that I gleaned from this conversation. And then we'll have another exposure to a similar theme when I go and hang out with my friends uh, after lodge. And you have all these exposures of conversations related to this search for light. And when you put all those together, you may be able to also discern a pattern from that whole noise. Just like you stacked all the images to create an astrophotography that was clean and crisp about these celestial bodies, in the in the extent to which you are having these conversations with other men that are also <clears throat> searching to become better fathers, better husbands, better entrepreneurs, you are giving yourself the all these layers that you're gonna combine and try to filter out the noise and find these nuggets. It's like, ah, I can see it with clarity now that this is mm. what's valuable. This is what's important. This is what I was looking for. So it, if I, if I may, I have yes, a please. story that, that would add on to that. So the church that I was most recently attending, I had been there for 15 years, met my wife there. Wait, um, wait, 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 wait. Are you not attending that church anymore? Okay. We have another podcast. Oh, episode two of... <laughs> Let's do it. I didn't know that. Okay, go ahead. But, uh, Carry on. 
and and my wife and I are currently looking for for another church. I mean, we're not we're not giving up on on the uh, institution known as church. Um, but whenever I was able to step away from that church because I was so heavily involved with leadership within that church, with uh, organizing within that church, with I was trying to organize a men's ministry. Um, I was their only, only song leader. Um, you know, and the church that I was going to is all acapella there. We don't have instruments. Oh, wow. really? Um, so I was their only song. Wait, leader. You don't have a drummer in a cage and smoke everywhere. You don't have all that stuff that churches have these days. Yeah, no, the, uh, the preacher doesn't come down on like a zip wire, you no? know, none of that. Wow. Uh, yeah. Old so, uh, <laughs> so either way it, it was, it was so interesting because whenever I was so worked up and, and I, I found myself angry oh. and I was angry because, you know, I had a disagreement with the elders uh, and so I found myself angry, but whenever I left the church and I like, I, it was like a burden was taken off of me. It's just like weight off of my shoulders. And then I was able to just sit back and I went, I totally lost the focus of what church is meant for yeah. because I got so wrapped up in the politics of church, caught hmm. up in the bureaucracy. I lost the worship of God. Right. And that's a problem. Wow. This is what happens to most elders. I think in most organizations, Yeah, mm -hmm. they get caught up in the mundane they get caught up in the political BS, the bureaucracy, and they lose sight of what it's all there for in the first place. Yeah. Sometimes you have mm -hmm. to be perfectly still and perfectly quiet so you can reconnect with whatever that purpose was. What did you come here in search of? And it was uh, the stars and anything in them. How did that start for you? Were you like, where did your interest in astronomy come from originally? Um, great question. One of the earliest memories I have of astronomy was when Comet Haley uh, was... The Haley Bop Comet? Is that what they... No, no. This is before that. Uh, uh, Comet Haley. Uh, this isn't the one that the cult like uh, drank the Kool-Aid and no. cut their nuts off and all that... <laughs> No, no. There was I, a whole I, religious group around the Haley Bob comment, I think. That's the, yeah, the Hale Bob. Uh, this Chris, one, you mean an outdoor degree in masonry? <laughs> <laughs> the one I'm talking about is is Halley's Halley's comet. Uh, Halley's. It, yeah, it has a an orbit that is 72 to 80 years around the sun. So I may not see it again because I remember. Uh, I'm trying to find here in in Google what year it was when it last came. But I, was... I remember there was a little robot when I was a kid called 2XL. Uh -huh. It was a little toy you could buy. And that was one of his facts was the Haley Comet that came like every 75 or 80 years. That's it. And it was coming around the time I had that toy. So I, I'm 49. You're like 44, you said? 45. 45. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing you were probably like very young. I was five or six years old, probably. Yeah, I just checked here. 1986 was the last of perihelion. Yeah. So, no, oh, you mean the year I was born? Really? 86? Mm -hmm. Oh, look at you that. You were how old? 37. You're going to be 38 in August. You're a spring chicken. I know. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, so, but I remember this comet was coming, and my family was making arrangements for us to go, and a few families stay in some cabins up in the mountains in Puerto Rico, there's like a, a mountain that had like a, either an observatory or somewhere where they could put their telescopes to check this thing out. And I was so excited to see this thing. I knew there was going to be a comet and I, it, this was going to be the first time I was going to see a comet. And I was so excited, but it was going to be very late at night. And they had to like either hike or something like that to get to the location. And I'm ready to go. And my dad's like, no, 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 you can't come. You got to stay here with, with your mom. And I was in shock. I'm like, what? What do you mean? Like, we came here to see this thing. And like, I have to stay behind. And they wouldn't let me go. I didn't go see it. Oh, damn. Yeah. So I was like, oh, my God. That was so, like, I was so close. I thought I was going to see it. I couldn't see it. And, you know, to make a, a, a long story short, they didn't see it either. So, huh, <laughs> take that, daddy. <laughs> <laughs> jokes on you yeah, bud. <laughs> yeah how do you like that but the point is like that kind of i think set off some interest in it and my dad had yeah. a telescope so we would look at the moon anytime there was any kind of celestial um 
occurrence that was of, of significance, we I remember us bringing our telescope out and setting it on the hood of our car and and having these like awe inspiring moments looking at the craters of the moon and, and everything. So that's how it started for me. And I've never lost it. I live in Central Florida and I rarely miss a rocket launch from the Cape. I can see them from my front yard. So I watch them online as they're counting down. And whenever, you know, I take my phone, keep the recording playing on my phone and I walk to the front of the house and I see it go to space. My That's wife me. does the exact same thing. It does she not literally wake me, me up in the middle of the night. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah she She's a huge uh, astronomy nerd. Huge. Like, I, I would almost want her on this podcast to talk to you. She, she'd chat your <laughs> ear off. Well, bring, bring her in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to, the thing is, like, it's not like he's just standing there talking. He backs it up with experiments. Like, you did live experiments with people to kind of showcase what you were talking about. Yes. Yeah, if you want me to, I can explain one of them that I did. Um, I wanted to further illustrate that whole noise to signal ratio and how having too much noise makes it difficult for you to get the signal. And what I did, I got volunteers to line up and then I got the first brother in the, in the front of the line to start reciting three numbers. And he would sit, mouth the numbers, just very softly say those numbers over and over and over and again. The I brother, think in our case, you had them singing a song. Mary had a little lamb, I believe, is yes, the song they had them singing. That's true. But here's another little insight into public speaking. I'm always tweaking it. And I realized yeah. that having people do something that everybody knows is, is what's important. Because if you tell them, oh, just say anything, they forget language. <laughs> they don't speak. They have no recollection of <laughs> letters and numbers and none of them like that. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's amazing <laughs> to see. So you have to be very specific, very precise, very decisive and assertive. And you're going to say this over and ah, over again. Interesting. Yeah. There's a little pro tip for public yeah. speakers out there. <laughs> yeah, really. So – I had the, the brother say, you know, imagine this brother here saying a, a sequence of numbers over and over and over again. And then I have this one at the very end trying to decipher what this brother is saying. Well, this is the signal and this is the receptor. And in between them, I had five other brothers, like you said, singing a song and, fla you know, waving their hands. So yeah. all of that interference made it almost impossible for that brother to hear what the other one was saying. But right. the moment that I tell all of them to be quiet and still, then the signal came through. And the brother, oh, yeah, he's saying 357, of course. You know, <laughs> that's exactly what happens. Uh, I don't know. If, yeah. Can you see the image that I shared? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So in the same thing happens with astrophotography. You have all this noise happening and the the sensor that's receiving the light can distinguish what's noise from what's light and, and shadow. It's just reacting to whatever it sees. So like I said earlier, the longer the exposure, uh, the greater the light collector, the better, which is one of the reasons why the Webb telescope is, is better. Uh, here's the comparison of the sizes. So you have 2.4 meters across the Hubble telescope compared to 6.6 .6 meters. And there's mm. another big difference. The Hubble uh, orbits so, around so the So what sun. you're saying here is size does matter. It does matter. Okay. You have to be perfectly still. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris just couldn't help himself. I know. <laughs> if I have a chance to be an elementary school student, I will. <laughs> <laughs> But also, look, if in this graph, you can see the Hubble is only 350 miles above the surface of the Earth, while the Webb telescope is almost a million miles away. Yeah. So it, it is in the perfect place to be quiet and still and looking at the light. But what I was going to show you is look at the difference in quality of these two images. One taken by the Hubble telescope and one by the James Webb telescope. 
And I encourage you to go out there and look at the comparisons of these two. And if you ever come across an image like this and you don't know which telescope took it, Hubble telescope, because of the shape, because of the architecture of the lens and the structure, the stars that are part of the image have four bursts, star bursts. You see them? Meanwhile, the shape of the James Webb telescope is a hexagon and you have six star bursts. Can you see them? Now, now for gonna... those listening on audio one, what, what is it that we're staring at? So that way they can Google the images. Oh, perfect. So we're looking at the pillars of life image from the James Webb telescope. So this is a nebula formation. So this is so gigantic. Like you can't obviously just by looking at it on a screen, you can't understand what you're looking at. But inside of these structures of gas that are floating out in unimaginable distances, stars are being born. And one thing that you'll notice when you see these, these two different images is that in the one taken by the Hubble telescope, you see these stars sp um, sprinkle throughout the image. And mm -hmm. you can tell they're stars because they have these little star bursts. Yeah, of course. On the one from the James Webb telescope, if you look really carefully, in all the empty space between the stars, you see all these other little lights. Mm -hmm. Those are galaxies. So wow. it's not just a star. We're talking about galaxies that have billions of stars in them. Wow. Now, we couldn't see that far when we put the Hubble telescope up there. It required better preparation, better tools. And for us to bring this back to the message that we were talking about, in order for us to better correspond with the divine, to better understand what this deity or this universal energy or whatever you want to call it is, we need to better equip ourselves, prepare ourselves in the process. That means just like in the lessons that we received, the masonry, uh, removing the excess, being able to square our actions, being able to circumscribe our desires, keep our passions within due bounds. All of these are methods and tools that we can implement so that we can have a better communication with the divine. Because in essence, we're getting rid of so much of the noise and so much of the interference so that our eyes can really perceive that which lies beyond. Not only that, but also to your point, one thing, one of the things that I've discovered in masonry is when I take my day-to-day -day interactions and I take how I conduct myself, um, Chris had mentioned, and by the way, he'll be back on here in a second. He just lost power at his house. But Chris had mentioned about getting the wives on. And so since I've joined Masonry, one of the things that I have really focused on is keeping my temper, my anger, all those things in check. And so one of the things that she said to me recently, she looked over at me in the living room one night and I was, I catch her staring at me and I'm like, what do you want? <laughs> and she goes, you know what just hit me? Because we had just had a, a difficult conversation about something. And I was like, what's that? She goes, I like this version of you. Oh, that's nice. The fact that I'm able to circumscribe and the fact that I'm able to uh, chisel at myself, that I'm able to look at my interaction and and you know look at my wife and say, hey, I, that's another part of me. I don't want to make her angry. Yeah. You know, my, my war is with the world. My wife is my peace. But also it's the same thing with my brothers in the lodge. With my brothers in the lodge, I don't want to intentionally hurt my brothers in the lodge, yeah. or people that I'm interacting with on a day to day basis. I don't know what they're what they're dealing with. True. I have no idea what they're dealing with. It is so simple for me to just be a consistent man the entire time. Be nice, be polite, be courteous. And hey, how can I help you today? I love that. What what can I do to make your day better? That's that's awesome. And if if we only had that perspective more often, it would be mm -hmm. such a better place to to live in. You know, it would. Yeah, it, it absolutely would. And I think there's there's a lot of those tenants that and I'm not I'm not again, I'm not beating up on the institution that is the church. I want to be very clear on that. But I think the church has lost some of those teachings somewhere along the line. And it's turned into, um, for example, there's this whole new faction of uh, I think it's called New Age Christianity, where uh, they're referring to God as daddy. Oh, that's gross. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's gross. Disgusting. Uh, and so, you know, I, I kind of look at it and it's like, all right, like if, Hey, Chris is back. Welcome. Um, 
I kind of look at it as, all right, if church were to be teaching those exact same tenets, because the tenets that we have in masonry aren't too dissimilar from the tenets that are found in the Bible. Mm -hmm. They're really not. And so if they were to be teaching those tenets of, hey, here's how you be a better man, a better woman. Here's how you interact with people. Here's how you control your temper. Here's how you, you know, keep your mouth shut uh, whenever you say things that you really want to say and you probably shouldn't say it unless you want to get smacked in the mouth. You know, those sorts of things. Um, I, I honestly do believe with all my heart that the world would be a better place. Masonry has has helped me with that. That's, awesome. that's something that I was missing in church. Uh, the thing awesome. is that it is in your it is in your dogma. Mm -hmm. It is in the book. It's all it's all over the book. Mm -hmm. The problem yeah. is that these books of faith, in my mind, um, they're they're really good vessels of moral lessons. That's really what they are. If you read through there, there's like moral lesson after moral lesson after moral lesson. Mm -hmm. But we don't focus on the lessons. We focus on these little details. And we twist them and we make them something that maybe they are, maybe they're not. Maybe they are today and they weren't yesterday. Like, well, it's called, that's called legalism. But so the lessons the, are timeless. Yeah. The, the, the lessons the, never change. The, the hang up is, and to, to kind of bring it back to Juan's point, and Juan, being able to look at something like the telescopes in this presentation that you just gave, and the fact that you were able to take a moral lesson from just basically a science experiment, well, you're, the, you know, block out the noise. That way you can see the picture more clearly. Every single person that has traveled to the mountains and looked up at the sky knows exactly what you just said and has not put it into such eloquent words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you go I, to the mountains and you're like, oh my gosh, the stars are beautiful. And it's like, well, because you're not getting the light pollution of the subdivision. Yeah. That's why. Matt, That's you touched on something that was going through my mind as I was seeing this presentation given live, which was where did he formulate the idea for this? Like, this didn't happen like in one sitting. I imagine this took you a bit. And like, you mean, how do you, uh, me? like, I want, yeah, I'm curious, like, how you had the idea how you ran with it to create a whole presentation out of it and then had the balls to stand up and tell your personal thoughts to people like, well, it's fascinating. I, I, I appreciate the question because it, it's one aspect of public speaking that I really love and nobody gets to see it. This is super mind, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and I'll, I'll run you a little bit through the whole thing. Um, I belong to a, a Masonic group that required that there was some sort of labor done. I had to do a paper in order to continue. Is it advancing. still a legal Masonic group according to our oh, current yeah. grandmaster? Yeah, very, very legal. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just checking. <laughs> um, so it, it, I started looking, okay, what things I'm interested in that I could create a presentation that it's going to meet the requirements of of the request, but also not feel like a boring thing that's too far out of my wheelhouse. So I started looking at the principle of hermeticism is what I was, that, that's what it all started with. The And you'll find that replete throughout Freemasonry, yes. the principles of hermeticism. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, this is that, as above, so below. Uh, that's the second principle of uh, of hermeticism, which is the principle of correspondence. And it just takes a little bit of connective tissue to go from as above, so below to see the connection of what's out there and what's in here. So you're able to uh, see that there are patterns that repeat themselves in the cosmos as well as in ourselves, right? And I've always been fascinated with that, uh, that synchronicity. It's like you have, um, it, one of the things that I say is like in space, why are all these planets going around the sun? Well, because the sun is the most massive Right. item in the solar system it contains the most mass thereby it has sure. the most gravity and i find that the fatter i get the more people like me i don't know if it's <laughs> there's a connection there i don't know if you noticed it <laughs> listen it's because you're less threatening okay <laughs> everybody wants somebody everybody wants a fat friend that's right all right no, everybody wants a fat nobody friend. wants sharp edges soft cheeks 
rounded. Right. Well, there, it's true. I mean, if you it, like, there are certain things that are ingrained in our DNA. Like, you're an artist, so I know that you know this. I don't even have to tell you. But when you hear a very low, deep sound, like an like like a really low, deep sound, your brain is wired to understand that's just dangerous mm -hmm. because that's an animal bigger than me that could eat me. Mm -hmm. And you hear a tiny, high-pitched doo -doo -doo noise. We love it because we're like, oh, harmless. Like, I could eat it. Interesting. Like, at our most basic core, it's that simple. Yeah. We're, we fear things and we don't. There's things that should fear us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that plays a little bit into this. Yeah. Is is that like core thing that we don't we don't think about, but it's in all of us at our at our core that keeps us safe. Yeah, and, and think that we may be getting away from being in touch with a lot of these intuitions. Yes. Uh, yes. And sometimes it's not by choice. Sometimes it's just by the sheer amount of stimulus that we're exposed to. Uh, in the presentation I gave yesterday, I had the, uh, the privilege to speak at uh, Pine Castle Lodge. And the presentation I, I was talking about, the entered apprentice degree and the tools and how to effectively use all these tools. And so there's a part of the presentation where I talk about the specific numbers. <laughs> uh, the numbers of how much media, and when I say media, I'm not being, uh, I'm not attacking the news or anything. I'm saying like content, like digital content. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we're at a point that there are groups in our society that are spending 13 plus hours a day consuming. And you'll be in shock. Can you guess what group is the one that I'm talking about specifically that's spending? Oh, it's 13? definitely children. It is definitely the boomers. Tell a boomer. Yeah. It's like, chill, boomer. Like, they are 13 plus hours consuming media. The boomers? The boomers. So next time. The people, wait, the boomers are older than me, right? Yes, they yeah. are. Huh. So, but because the media. You just got Chris really excited given I what know, he does for I his occupation. Such ammunition. Now he's going <laughs> to come back. That's it. We're going to start advertising in newspapers again. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> As a representative of the Generation X, uh, We are really far behind the amount of consumption that they have, but it's still embarrassing to admit how much it is. Uh, but the point is, like, we're talking about live television. We're looking at, you know, screen uh, on your cell phones, on the laptop. It's all the amount of time that we're spending looking at a screen. The more you're doing that, the less you have an opportunity to just be quiet and just chill and just relax. You know, just tell me this, and I don't, I'm, I'm guessing, but is it easier or harder for you to sit down with a book to read? Honestly, I've been doing it for the last six weeks. Nice. And I'm in a different situation than Matt. Like, I'm disconnected a little bit, so it's I'm enjoying the hell out of nice. it. Nice. But you, are you having any trouble staying focused, or you're you're good? I've, I've worked through some stuff, okay. so I feel pretty good about it right now. Nice, yeah, nice. but it wasn't easy in the beginning. You're right. I've been doing it more recently, but that's because in October, I have to sit in the East for an EA degree. Oh, boy. So <laughs> Good luck. I don't think active memorization is the same as reading. <laughs> yeah. No, no, normally, whenever it comes to books, I, I typically do audio books because yeah. I drive so much. You uh, know, my truck's a year old. I got almost 30,000 miles on it. No, I, I actually look forward to it because there's something about getting lost in somebody else's reality. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like when I pick up my book, I the, the last book I read was about <laughs> I'm a nerd. So I'm reading about quantum physics. Heck yeah. And uh, to me, that's like fascinating. And I want to get lost in that world. I get lost in it. I wish I could be a quantum physicist, but I'm, I'm an, I never went to college. So it's not it's not the stars for me. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I can't like learn about the the concepts. Right. Like, I can't practice it, but I can learn about it. I love it. Are you on Goodreads? Anybody who uses Goodreads that listens to this, look me up on the winding stairs and give me your username. Goodreads is where I keep I keep a catalog of all the books I own, all the books I want to okay. read, all yeah. the books I've read, all the books I'm reading. So I'm able to quantify how much I'm reading year by year. I can tell you when I read what, 
I can tell you. It's called Goodreads. Goodreads. Yeah, it's an application. I've never heard of it. It's a website and an application. Okay. So it even scans the the UPC code of your books. So you can go in in your library, go book by book. Bleep, this is in my collection. This oh, wow. This is in my collection. This is in my collection. And then you can share that with other you people? You can share that with other people. That's fascinating. Yeah. And you can discover what your friends think about some books. It's like, I didn't know that you were into those books. And now I'm super curious about what it is. You know? So Yeah. The last hard book that I read, um, of course, outside of the scriptures, but the last hard book that I read was actually The Fourth Turning by, uh, I think his name's Neil Howe. But that's uh, also a somewhat religious kind of a book, right? No, no, that's actually a history book. Uh, Is it? So it's written by two historians. And uh, I think I've told you about it before, but I, I would suggest anybody read it because it helped my cross-generational communication Sweet. better than anything <laughs> I've ever done in my life. It's insane. What it does, it goes back to 1450 and it tracks four archetypes that just repeat themselves every 20 years oh, yeah. or sorry, every 80 years. Uh, they just repeat themselves over and over again. And it was two historians that wrote it. And so uh, whenever you look at it and you, you read about the archetypes, for example, the Gen X archetype is known as the nomadic archetype. More laid back, more easygoing, just kind of go with the flow type people. We're the forgotten um, generation. We have to find our own way. <laughs> yeah. Well, honestly, and that's because you're between two yeah. very headstrong archetypes. Ooh. Yeah. You've got the boomers, which are the prophetic archetype, and they are very emotional. They're very headstrong. They're very take charge. They were raised in a blooming and beautiful society. Those are the people running all governments in the world right now. Yes. Yep. They are running governments. They're running lodges. They're running churches. They're running everything right now. But then you also have my generation, which are the millennials, which are known as the heroic archetype. And the heroic archetype are the ones typically you'll find. The heroic you know, archetype. Yeah. So there's I don't the, remember Hercules living with Zeus until he was 30. <laughs> <laughs> but but generally what happens and this is what we're seeing is is you'll see the heroic archetype kind of do like a, a, an aggressive takeover of everything. Yeah. And the nomad the nomadic at that point is starting to age out as well. They'll go along with whatever the next guys are doing. Okay, let's do it. Just it's a great you. book. I grew up like reading a lot of science fiction. A lot of Isaac Asimov, Frank Herbert, um nice. you know, everything Star Trek. Like that's kind of where I learned. I didn't have a father, so that's kind of where I learned about how to be a good person is from science fiction, because it always it was always centered in some morality, you know. It was always wild and crazy, but it was centered around some kind of like societal thing, and it was teaching you like a moral lesson. So my wife is extremely religious, and she showed me a book she got when she was a kid, and that's how they wrote the Bible. It's like for kids, so everything's dumbed down, like. Not dumbed down, but simplified, I guess simplified. you should say, for children. You got to go to their level. You got to go where they're at and try to communicate with yeah. them. Yeah. Talking yeah. about communication. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I was going to show you here. the. Ooh. I don't know if I share that with you. That image right there, I tried to put some of the elements from the presentation. So... I have this, the, a stair going up into the heavens. So it's almost like Jacob's ladder. And then you yeah. have the rocket going up. Um, and you have oh, the rocket. Okay. So you have the pillars in, in our conversation t today. Obviously, this is what we talked about today was very little compared to all the content that's in the presentation. So if anybody's interested in, in hearing the full presentation uh, with all the little secrets and and easter eggs that you can see on on this image just reach out to me and and we can coordinate how to how to make it happen um well interestingly is that is that underneath the b column i won't say the yeah. word of the b but um is that a representation of an it atom is. it is so okay so below and then as above, and then you have on the a sun in the yeah in the opposite. It could be interpreted as the sun. And if you look, mm -hmm. it's also a circumpunct. So I just posted yesterday about the circumpunct on our. I don't know if you saw it. I, oh, I missed it. But I've got a tattoo of a circumpunct ah. because before I joined, way before, like I was fascinated by symbology uh -huh. and. Um, I did research on the circumpunctalate, and it, it, you, you can trace that back far, far back. Yeah. And it's represented, it, it represents the symbol gold, it represents the sun. It was literally the 
hieroglyph for Ra, which is the sun god, the name of Ra. Like all throughout history, the circumpunct has represented light, sun, oh, true. knowledge, information. I love that. And Pythagor- Pythagoras actually adopted it into, he made like a whole little culture around that. That's awesome. Um, and it represents uh, the beginning, right? So he talks about how from a point to a line, from a line to a superficies, from a superficies to a solid, is all represented in this one symbol and has a group of scientific followers behind that. I love that. Um, and we represent it in every lodge mm-hmm. in the state of Florida. Um, no one knows that it's a circumpunct, but it certainly is a circumpunct oh, yeah. with, with two lines on the side. And you talk about hermeticism. That's like blatant hermeticism yeah. right here. We've got like one, we've got the animal side and we've got the educated side. Yep. Um, in you know, and you've got this man who's like, I get you wrap it in Christian symbols and that satisfies certain people on a surface level. Mm-hmm. But the concepts, both in Christianity and in Masonry, yep. are very synonymous back throughout history to the beginning of civilization. This is what fascinates me about masonry yeah. because it uses symbols to communicate ideas. And we explain that symbol in the Entered Apprentice lecture, right? We do. We say, uh, this is what this all means. And then you hear the fellow craft lecture and we talk about Pythagorean ideas of the point and the line and the superficies and the solid. Yeah. Nobody has any idea that that's what's being explained Look to them. This is like all human knowledge is contained within Freemasonry. Yeah, but that's why the conversations that happen outside of the lodge are so important. Because like now we're just, you know, gathered around having this conversation, geeking out on astronomy and philosophy and hermeticism and all that kind of stuff. We are hashing out some of the things that we were so swiftly presented during a degree. Yeah. So it's just yeah. the... It's just a faint memory of a symbol, but that's fine because then we have these conversations uh, over a uh, Le Croix. <laughs> <laughs> and, a, and a Capri Sun. And a Capri Sun. <laughs> I think that was before we started recording, it but Juan it was. It was, but actually I actually referenced it. the Capri Sun as. In my Puerto Rican some... accent. Okay. So when I say Capri Sun, I say Capri Sun because I say from. Puerto Rico. You know, actually, and, and just hearing you talk about this one and looking at some of the symbology and everything, I know a lot of what the profane have a problem with masonry is, is our symbology mm-hmm. and is some of the phrases like you've refer- you've referenced as above, so below a couple of times. And that phrase has been hijacked and it's been hijacked by certain groups. So Christianity. I would- Let's be honest. Uh, no, Christ- Christianity wants nothing to do with that phrase. That's what I mean. They turned it into something bad because right. it's actually now mostly associated with the Baphomet. Right. Right. The Baphomet is a symbol literally pointing up and down, and it means as above, so below. And it's got a goat head, and it's half man mm-hmm. and half human. And well, it, well, it, it what first I'm, what came I'm saying... into the reference uh, at the Templars when the Templars were actually – uh, being persecuted and they were put under torture. A lot of them confessed to worshiping the Baphomet, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, the Baphomet then became a bad thing. And Christians generally look at the devil as the Baphomet. So there's now a correlation because of generally because of Christians and not, not you, I'm talking about yep. going back to the 1300s now. Yeah. I'm talking about like those Catholics um, that assign that to be this negative evil thing but it really is whiz- ancient wisdom. Yeah. yeah, and it's more ancient than we give it credit for. So, and it, it j- well, no. What, what I was getting at is, I would love to have Juan on and 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 us do a deep dive on some of the symbology and its origins and I its roots. It. And so that way, if you do have somebody that is like, okay, if you're the as above, so below thing, or um, oh, there he goes, as a- on. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, just some of the stuff they harp on. You can literally say, "No, actually, this is the actual origin of yeah. whatever that yeah. was," and it twisted at this yeah. time. It's just it takes a little more thinking and a little more listening, and most people don't want to do yeah. either of those things these and days. And I, what I thought you were going to say, Chris, earlier was that the issue that some people may have with our fraternity was because when you said the symbols, I thought you were going to say because the fear that some of the symbols present you know if you have symbols of mortality symbols of 
<laughs> had a coffin on your picture. Exactly. And you had skull and crossbones. Yeah. So, and those are associated with death. Yeah. And that death is bad. And, yeah. And people forget yeah. that everybody's carrying around a skull right behind their face. Uh, so <laughs> 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 I just covered it with the meats. Uh, that's why it's not so scary. Uh, well, and, and, and even still, and Chris, we, you know, we can kind of hint on this a little bit, but, um, but so I'm, I'm a York, right? Mason. And right before you go through commandry, uh, to become a Knights Templar, uh, they place you in a dark room. Um, and so they have certain items laid out on the table in front of you, including a Bible open. It's to a essentially passage. a chamber of reflection is what yes. they're putting you in. So, Ooh, and, and I'm not going to say everything that's on the table cause I don't want people to freak out. But um, but the the thing is, is you're supposed to draw a moral lesson from that. If a person did not want to use the two brain cells they have left, they could be like, oh, no, that's bad and evil. And it's like, no, it's actually very beautiful. Yeah, because what I took from that entire thing is the finality of death. And what am I going to do with the time I have here on this earth? Exactly. Yeah, I should. But there has to be a genuine desire to search for light. So sometimes people they complain. It's like, oh, my God, there's so many people dying and. Like, why aren't we spending, you know, less money and sending rockets up to space and putting these telescopes up there? The James Webb telescope is a project that was billions of dollars in the making. And, and it, it involved, like, how many nations? Many, yeah. And the the time, the manpower, the, the capital, all of that it, it involves. But it is a genuine search for light in the literal yeah. and figurative sense. We are trying yeah. to understand the universe better. And... We should have that kind of approach when it comes to trying to understand. It's not like with religion, for example. I can understand how someone would, who was born in the United States, of course, is going to be exposed to a specific set of uh, religious dogma and history, and that becomes the religion that they follow. But yeah, someone who was born in India, it's very unlikely – to be exposed to the same story, the same, but you will find some threads of yes. truth within both of those paths. And you yeah. may have an individual that's born in Kolkata that goes through life exemplifying the teachings of Jesus and lives a high moral life and eventually is remembered as someone exemplary. That is possible. So sometimes we demonize the opposite and many times it's because we do not yeah. understand what it entails. We don't understand their symbols. We don't understand the story. Uh, but that genuine desire to know, it's like, like, why do they practice this? What do they do here? How do they feel about this? What do they believe about this other thing? That genuine um, search for light is what allows you to then really focus and, and get to see what, you know, what lies beyond the noise, if if you may. Good good way to bring it all together there. <laughs> yes. Could not put a more perfect bow on the top of that package. Yeah, that was beautiful. I appreciate it. That's cool. Yeah, we, we this is something that we can definitely uh, a conversation we can have over some libations and three ruffians. This message brought oh, to you by some cigars. Okay, okay. And he knows how to plug. Right. Well, Juan, look, I cannot thank you enough. That uh, phenomenal concept, uh, everything. And the fact that you're able to look at a telescope and derive a moral lesson from a telescope. I mean, that's that that takes a, a special a special switch. And not only that, but it was actually a very good thank concept. You. I appreciate it. You know, it wasn't just like, oh, telescope neat. And then it's like, man, this is a snooze fest. No, like that's actually a lot to think about. Thank you. I, I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much for having me. My, it will be my pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, listen, before we mm -hmm. go. Matt, did you have any other questions for Juan or anything you wanted to hit him no, with? No, I've, I've got a lot to go home and chew on at this point. Yeah. And we've both lost power. He's the only one that hasn't. So <laughs> yeah. um, he's obviously doing better than we are. Juan, when we do these podcasts, we don't know who's going to be listening. We know that they're probably Masons. They might not be Masons. This podcast in particular is meant for people that aren't Masonry that want to learn about it. So with that in mind, is there anything that you would want to say to the listeners out there? As a as a man, as a mason, as a dad, as an artist, of of course, um, I do appreciate the spending the time with us in, in this conversation. One thing that's really important to me is creating things that are going to be a catalyst for conversation. I love to talk, 
And through my paintings, through my speeches, through the content I create, what I'm attempting to do is to, to have that little spark of curiosity so that we can engage in a conversation. Hopefully one day we come across each other and we're able to have a, a more personal, more profound conversation about these things. Um, but it, it fulfills me to hear that, you know, what I am creating, what I'm putting out into the world is starting some conversations. So if you found any of this valuable, I would love for you to follow uh, the work that I do. If you're a Mason and where can they do that? Say it again. Where can they find your art? So, where can they follow you? Work? So if they're interested in Freemasonry and my Masonic art, they can go to the winding stairs.com. Um, I started the winding stairs in 2012 as an effort of self introspection and as an outlet for me to teach to me, for me to learn and teach. And I've been fortunate to, you know, connect with a lot of people and you can see the art, you can see the content about Freemasonry there. Uh, but I have been a professional artist for 20 years this year and my art is not limited to Freemasonry. I am a surrealist. Uh, I do oil paintings, sell them through galleries to collectors. And you can see my collection by going to juansepulveda.com. Juansepulveda.com is where you can find uh, a little insight into, you know, what got me here. So we will put links in this podcast cool. to the winding stairs and to Juan Sepulveda. Oh, wow. That's how it is. Son. Sepulveda. <laughs> and uh you know you a capri sun on us we'll have it delivered to you yeah, along with a three ruffian <laughs> cigar i dare you to try both at the same time uh, challenge um, accepted actually you are a masonic speaker so if people want to book you for a master mason association a lodge mm -hmm. education that's something you're open to doing yep. correct yep. Yeah, I do them often. How can they reach out to you for that? Um, if, if you can reach out to me through any of those uh, websites, okay. the contact form in there goes to the same bucket, basically. So just reach out to me there at juansimplemail.com or thewindingstairs.com and just fill out the contact form and, and we'll take it from there. Excellent. Thank you, brother. Thank you for coming on the show and sharing time with us and talking about this topic. It, I'm so happy to, that we got you to come on and Thank do it. Thank you so much for the invitation, Matt. It was a pleasure meeting you and spending some time with you, brother. Absolutely. You're not too far, so I'll see you Mason, soon. Mason, you're a phenomenal guy. <laughs> so you're it? not too far, so I'll see you sooner than later. For yeah. sure. He's doing some interesting things at Turkey Creek, so give him a couple years before you go out and see his lodge. He'd be embarrassed if he came today, but give him a couple years and come out and see it. Nice. Yeah, we need a coat of paint or two. Nice. Yeah, no... A couple of years of past masters, they'll have it straight. Oh, no, uh -oh. that's not what's going to happen. At <laughs> Chris, I'm Even the level the podcast. <laughs> Out. <laughs>